let's start talking about reaction rates. In this video, we'll explain the relationship between the rate of reaction and some experimental parameters. There are three pieces of essential knowledge. The first one is that the rate of reaction is defined as how quickly the reactants are being turned into products. The second one is that the rates of change of reactants and products are determined by the stoichiometry of the balanced equation. And the third one is that these rates are influenced by several experimental conditions, including concentration, temperature, surface area, catalysts, and other environmental factors. We'll start by defining kinetics. Kinetics is the study of how quickly a reaction is happening. In other words, how quickly reactants are being turned into products. Since we're measuring how quickly something is happening, that means that this is a rate of change. This little triangle, delta, means change. That means we're looking for a change in something over time. So we should expect the unit for this to be some unit over some kind of time unit. So how can we measure this? We could measure changes in concentration using Beers-Lambert law. We could also measure concentration through electrical conductivity because more ions means more conductivity. We could also measure changes in pH because pH is really just a measure of ion concentration, specifically the hydrogen ion concentration. We could use pOH, of course, to measure the concentration of OH, or hydroxide ion concentrations. If we have a reaction that either consumes or produces gases, we could measure properties of gases like pressure or volume. This would be helpful if we have a closed container. If the container is open, then those gases may be allowed to escape, in which case we might have a change in mass. So measuring that would be more helpful if we have an open container or an open system. And then once we can measure the change in concentration of one thing, either one reactant or one product, we can use the stoichiometry of the balanced equation to help us figure out the changes in concentrations of all the other species involved in that reaction. If we want to speed up or slow down a reaction, we can do that by manipulating various factors. If we increase the concentration, we should increase the reaction rate. If we increase the temperature, we should increase the reaction rate. If we increase the surface area, we should increase the reaction rate. If we add a catalyst, that would also increase the reaction rate. That is because to increase the reaction rate, we want the particles of the reactants to collide more often. So if we have more particles, if those particles move more quickly, if they can come in contact with each other more often and in the right orientation, they're more likely to react. So all of those things, concentration, temperature, surface area, and catalysts help that to happen. So by increasing any of those things, we also increase the reaction rate. Once we've collected the data over time, we can start to analyze it. When I'm looking at this first graph, I notice that this line right here is increasing. That helps me see that this is a product because this thing, whatever it is, is being produced. I'm getting more and more of it over time. And this, whatever this species was, is being consumed. It's being used up. So that tells me that this was a reactant. I can also see that the reactant was being used up at about the same rate as the product was being produced. In other words, this slope is about the same as this slope, although they're negatives. So the rate of consumption of the reactant is about the same as the rate of production 
of the product. So that tells me that we've got the reactant being turned into the product and it's about a one-to-one -one ratio because those slopes are about equal. When I look at this graph down here, once again, I can find the product because this is being produced as well as this. I've got two products. I've got this product and I've got this product. Both of those things are being produced and I've got one reactant. This is being consumed. So here I've got a reactant. When I look at this key right here, it tells me what I've labeled as P1 is NO, and what I've labeled as P2 is O2. And what I've labeled as the reactant is NO2. So I can start to write that equation. NO2 is going to break down and give me NO plus O2. Of course, I could just balance that equation, but I can also balance it using the slopes of these lines. When I look at this slope on the oxygen, I notice that it's not as steep as this slope on the NO. So the NO is being made twice as fast as the O2. You could actually do the calculations on the slope and see that it's twice as fast. When we think about the NO2 slope here, is that slope the same as the slope for O2 or the slope of NO? You might be able to eyeball that or you might have to actually do the math. Either way, we should be able to eventually come to the conclusion that it is the same as the slope for the NO. So we get this two and this two and then the oxygen has the one. So these coefficients balance the equation from a stoichiometric standpoint but we also see that reflected in the slopes of the change in concentration. In the two cases we looked at above where we had the graph, we were able to measure the change in concentration of all reactants and products. But sometimes we're only able to measure the change in concentration or the change in pressure of one. That's okay. Even if we only have the change in concentration or change in pressure of one species. So species can be a reactant or a product. We can use the stoichiometry of the balanced equation to help us get those other changes. Let's look at how we might do this. Here we have an equation where we have nitrogen and hydrogen forming NH3 or ammonia. Notice that hydrogen is going to be consumed three times faster than the nitrogen. And this will be produced two times faster than the nitrogen. So now they want us to find the rate of consumption of nitrogen and hydrogen, knowing the rate of appearance of NH3. We know that NH3 has a rate of appearance of 1.5 times 10 to the negative 4 moles per liter or molarity per second. 1.5 times 10 to the negative 4 molarity per second. Moles per liter, remember, is molarity. So you could write it molarity per second or moles per liter times seconds either way. And if I'm talking about nitrogen, I know that for every two NH3s that get produced, one N2 is consumed. And remember that if I'm talking about something being consumed, that rate should be negative. I'm talking about a rate of disappearance, so my rate should be negative on that one. So that will give me a negative 7.5 times 10 to the negative 5 molarity per second. That's for N2. I can do the same thing for H2. 1.5 times 10 to the negative 4 molarity per second. That's what I was originally given. For every two NH3s that get produced, I consume three H2s. So 1.5 times 3 divided by 2 gives me 2.3 times 10 to the negative 4. This is a consumption again, so I'm going to make that negative molarity per second. That was for H2. When we're talking about the rate of reaction, 
It should be always positive, and it should have a coefficient of one. So if you have a reactant or product that has a coefficient of one, you can use that rate, just make sure that it's positive. If you do not have one that has a coefficient of one, then just divide by the coefficient. So since nitrogen has a coefficient of one, we can use 7.5 times 10 to the negative five molarity per second, because that is the rate for nitrogen and its coefficient is one. We are making a positive note. If we didn't have nitrogen, we could just take either this rate from NH3 and divide by two, which would give us 7.5, or we could take this rate for H2, make it positive, so 2.3, and this time divide by three, and we would still get 7.5 times 10 to the negative five. In the second example, they've given us the rates and they want us to go backwards. They want us to figure out what those coefficients should be. So we know the rate for A, and we know the coefficient should be two. If we look at B, we don't know the coefficient, but we know the rate. We know the rate is 0 0.150. So if we think about the rate of disappearance of A, that's 0 0.05, and the rate of disappearance of B is 0.15. So B is going to have a larger coefficient, and is gonna be larger than two, and larger by what? If we think about how we can get from here to here, that will help us get that coefficient. So 0 0.05 times what would give us 0 0.5? Here that x is three. So our coefficient should be three times bigger than two. So two times three is six. So n would equal six. We can do the same thing for Q. Again, 0 0.075 is larger than 0 0.05. So we know our coefficient is going to be larger, but what exactly is it going to be? 0 0.05 times what is going to give us 0 0.075? In this case, x is 1.5. So two times 1.5 is three. So that's what our Q coefficient would be. And then finally, we can do the same thing for our R coefficient. In this case though, this one is going to be smaller. 0 0.05 times X would give us 0 0.025. What would X need to be? In this case, X would be 0 0.5. So two times 0 0.5 would give us one. So our R coefficient would be one. So if we were to rewrite this equation, we would write it as two A plus six B gives us three C and one D. That would be our new equation. Here we're asked to express the rate of the reaction in terms of the rate of change of each reactant and product. Remember that we said that the rate of change of the whole reaction should be thought of as though it had a coefficient of one. So the rate of the reaction is going to be slower than the rate of anything that has a coefficient. For example, for ClO minus, we've got to use three ClO minuses to get one reaction to fully happen. So the reaction rate is going to happen much slower, in fact, one third as fast as the change in the concentration of ClO minus. And since we're consuming that ClO minus, we're gonna say it's also gonna be the opposite sign, negative one third, the rate of change of ClO minus. If we are talking about the product ClO three minus, that already has a coefficient of one. So our reaction rate would be the same as our rate of change of ClO3 minus, because this has a coefficient of one, and we can think of our reaction rate as having a coefficient of one. Since ClO3 minus is a product, it would have a positive rate of change, and our reaction rate has a positive rate of change, so we don't need to put a negative sign. Our last product is Cl minus. It's a product, 
So again, it's going to be positive, just like our reaction rate. So we don't have to worry about a negative sign. But it does have the coefficient of 2. So that means that we are going to be using up chlorine ions twice as fast as we get the reaction rate to happen. So our reaction rate is going to be one half the speed of our change in concentration of chlorine ions. One way to do this sort of as a trick really quickly is to just put a one on top of any coefficient so that our reaction rates are always one over all of our coefficients. And any reactant is going to end up being a negative. Any product stays positive.